Hey everybody, welcome to episode three of As Yet Untitled. Uh, it's about two guys sitting in comfy chairs, talking about things. Drinking coffee, drinking water, hanging out. Between two Tims. Tim Stafford, Tim Gombas. Two Tims near plants. Near plants, not between them because that's copyrighted. Amongst. With Tim and Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should just drop some lines in while we're talking. It just Whatever we're talking about, just drop some <laughs> just lines Just see if in. you can't, like, yeah, if you can't quote. Uh, are we going? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. In the last, last, in the last episode, <laughs> previously on between two Tims, where we left our heroes, um, we were talking about because um, what's a hero? What is a hero? <laughs> Sometimes there's a man. I mean. <laughs> That was great. Thank that you. was good. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so we were talking about um, kind of understanding where Scripture is, right? And God speaking, has spoken, is spoken, is spoken, is speaking. Um, so here's my question. This is where I ended with. Uh, I recently had this conversation about judgment, okay? And so interpretations of Scripture, a lot of judgment, the way we talk about judgment, leads to this conversation of, like, your understanding of what God intends for you or wants you to do, right? This right or wrong thing. And if you do the wrong thing, you're going to go to this place where you're going to be tormented forever. If you do all the right things or if you follow oh, this yeah. thing correctly, you're going to go this way, right? And then so we have this big like fear of, of going the wrong way. And but it's like, but scripture. So uh, what brought this up for me was like contextualizing scripture. And learning that something that we do hear often in the church is out of context with what it actually was being said in the time period and, oh, the, yeah. and the framework and whatnot. I was like, it's well, basically like the, our entire mode of existence of being church. Yes, and what so we, and how we so use it is out of context. I yeah. had like a thing where I was like, whoa, then if we're being judged on our understanding and then our adherence to these things, but we don't actually understand them, <clears throat> and they're not always super straightforward, or the or the context is really important then what exactly are we being judged on? Because um, does that make sense? Because then what we think we're being judged on, we don't even understand. So does that mean that we're all going this way because we weren't doing the right thing oh, because our under right, right, because right, we, right. whether it was ignorance or not, you're being judged on a set of rules. And if you don't understand the rules, you're still being judged on them. Right. So it made this whole judgment thing kind of like spiral in my head. And um, we had a great conversation talking about how um, God's judgment is... Um, is kind of here and now, and and it's in, in this idea of like, um, how did he frame it exactly? Like, uh, when God kind of gives you over to your sin or the things that you're kind of yeah. like going into, and like, and that kind of becomes like the, you know, your that separation is kind of now in, yeah. in a sense and stuff. But yeah, the, yeah. Um, so there's a sense in which currently, well, yeah. There's so much to be said about all this. Um, when Peter writes to his audiences, he tells them like judgment is beginning now with the people of God. So like this is a current age of judgment for God's people in the sense of like refining, um, sanctifying, um, yeah, all kinds of dynamics that are going on. And the the people of God are to be this people that are constantly self-critical, um, growing in discerning ways that idolatries have crept in so that when we get to the final day, we're not judged at that point. Yeah. Um, furthermore, there's a sense in which, um, in, in the current time, this experience of life in this world can be like basically hell um, if, we, if we choose to live in a completely godless way or giving ourselves over to sort of unbroken pursuits of uh, sensual pleasure, uh, unrestrained sexual indulgence, um, unbroken pursuits of uh, accumulation of items. I mean, just like all these ways of life that appear promising and um, hopeful are ultimately deadening and sort of like rob us of our humanity, which is a kind of a proto-hell experience or like a, you know, a preview of hell. That's certainly the case. Um, so, I mean, all those things are valuable to think about. The one thing that I'm just always 
um, hesitant about is poor uses of Romans 1. Because <clears throat> um, I think that that's a style, I just want to make this footnote um, about the handing over language. Just because I think that that is, that's not something that God does in individuals' lives. God does not hand over individuals. Um, that's, a, that's one way that biblical language has been hijacked to like, I don't know, condemn people or to make other people feel like self-important. Paul is really talking about uh, the wide sweep of humanity uh, has not embodied God's role for humanity. And so God, because he's a God of invitation and not coercion, he's like, you know, all right, I'm going to continue inviting, but I'm not, I'll let you go this route if this is what you want as a whole, as, as human history. Um, yeah. End of footnote. So but <laughs> moving on, um, when it comes to these judgment passages, I think that um, I've thought about this a lot lately. Christian people, at least this is how I was raised, um, and I had parents that were like rational, good people, but like they were raised this way. Um, evangelical culture trains us this way to start with hell. Like that's the first, like that's the foundation. Yeah. Hell is the building block. Hell is the, the foundation stone of our theology. And hell is the center of our theology. So like you have this, our whole theology is oriented by fear and a God who um, starts with hating us. Mm -hmm. Like that's the starting point. God hates you. He's coming after you. He's got you in his crosshairs. Um, so invite Jesus into your heart and then that scenario is over. And now he loves you. And it's like, so now you still have this God of like um, outrageous wrath who he may not be after you anymore, but he's after everybody that you love because a, a hell has been, hell surrounds our, our theology. It's the center of our theology and it's the foundation of our theology. It's all about hell and hell avoidance. Mm -hmm. So we're all kind of like, and that shaped our posture and being Christian too. Like we're backing into our Christian life. It's like we know it sucks. Being Christian is this horrible thing, but at least we're not going to go to hell. Right. It's it's this whole list of stuff you can't do that will make you go to hell. So just don't do all that stuff. And it's all the fun stuff in this world. But at least you won't <laughs> go to hell. I mean, that's the kind of Christianity that I was raised with. But, um, yeah, that's not that's not the structure of... The faith in scripture i mean things begin and end with the god who's revealed in jesus so that so um the center and the foundation and the um the circumference and sort of the thing that puts its arms around our whole view of life is this god of invitation and outrageous love and delight in his creation and his passionate pursuit of us and um his his longing and desire that we would enter into this reality where we manifest this kingship uh, over this world um, because that lifts our hearts and that, that lightens our hearts and that, that is um, uh, an intentional, purposeful way of being that runs against the grain of this world but when you actually step into it by faith you discover it's actually the lighter way. It's not a burden. Um, that's such a beautiful paradox when Jesus says that my, you know, my burden is light, my yoke is easy because it's like it is a yoke. It's like get up on that freaking cross. Yeah, and it's yeah. like ah, man, this is gonna, I'm, this is not the promising way, to be stripped naked on this cross, dying. And what we find is this is this is awesome. Like it, it's, it's the lighter way. Um, so any, anyway, that's the scenario. And all of the hell statements and judgment statements in Scripture are directed largely towards. God's people yeah. who um, inhabit this identity as God's people and uh, have kind of grown complacent and don't want to be serving one another but want to be kind of mistreating each other and end up doing that. And then don't want to be uh, embodying God's mission to the world joyfully um, so that we don't do that. Then then God starts to like use this fear of judgment language toward, toward us. Um, and it's not like we're doing it wrong. It's just, uh, sorry, there's one other element to this. Um, and when God's people actually start to look over the fences toward worldly ways of life, and those look way more attractive, and we want to actually do things the world's way, um, that's when God will then 
bring all that language up. And the, and the message is not like, look, people, get your act together or you're going to hell. Yeah. It's more like the end of that way of life is destruction. So don't go that way. Stay within this bounds of blessing. Stay within these these uh, these constraints of flourishing, and what you, what we find within those constraints is there's unlimited freedom. It's it's actually a life of blessing and goodness. Um, so anyway, all that to say, um, becoming part of God's people and lifting up His name um, is to enter into this way of life where. Uh, there are just endless options, and there's not really a fear that we're going to do it wrong necessarily. Yeah. Um, so long as we're actually focusing on the heart of what this is all about, cultivating humility. Or I mean, w there's a lot of places where we can start. I, I often think about the two things that are the reasons why God is angry in Romans 1 with humanity. Um, they don't honor God as God, and they don't give Him thanks. So it's like, you know what? That's a pretty good way to avoid hell. Just gather as community. Lift up the name of the one true God revealed in Jesus and give him thanks. And like, you're doing it right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's actually not that complicated. It's not like this hard thing you've got to add up and make sure that we're getting it right. You know what I mean? Um, what do you think that looks like, too? Like, just those two specific things the getting together and the giving thanks. Like, and like tangibly, like, what do you think the giving thanks is? Like, what, how, does that, how does that manifest in like a community? Yeah, well, uh, like what I was saying last night, giving thanks is a is a it's multifaceted. I think in the New Testament, um, in in the imperial context, I mean everybody in the Roman Empire needs to give thanks to Caesar because he's the reason that you have all your stuff, and he's the reason why this is there's peace in the empire. He's the one that conquers uh, and you know chaos at the at the far edges of the of the empire and keeps us all uh, in places of flourishing. And um, to give Caesar thanks is to name that whole political reality and to like, like all of our stuff is, is mine because Caesar is awesome, yeah. Caesar is Lord. So to lift up the name of the one true God is to actually sit in my life and, and as a community to like name all the dynamics that we enjoy as gifts from, from God and Christ and then to hold them loosely and strategize about how to share them with other people who need stuff. So I mean, if we just if we just did that as communities of Jesus followers, uh, we'd be we'd be doing a lot. Um, oh, okay, and by the way, uh, if you go to the end of if you go to Matthew twenty five and think about some of the, one of these judgment texts, okay, and and think about what it means to embody this this kind of reality. Jesus says in Matthew 25, at the end, at the end of all this thing, uh, the Son of Man is going to be revealed and the sheep and the goats are all going to show up. And I'm going to tell one group to part to judgment and another group enter life. And I'm going to say to this one group, um, uh, you may enter life. And they're going to say, well, why? What do you mean? Well, every because here's what you did. You, uh, people who are thirsty, you gave them a drink of water. People who are hungry, you fed them. People who were naked, you clothed them. Uh, people who uh, were foreigners, you welcome them, and um, and whenever you did those kinds of things, you were doing that to me. Yeah, yeah. And then the opposite, you know, there were some people that never did that. So like that's what it looks like. So like if we gathered as communities and just strategized um, in our town right now, doing those, yeah, just make a list and yeah. like don't even add to the list or take away. Yeah. Just like say, okay, for the next ten years, yep. let's find out within a two mile radius of our church. Who uh, is facing like uh, a food crisis? Yeah. So, like, what single moms uh, really are having trouble putting food on the table uh, week to week? Just, just do that as a church. And if every Christian community just did that, oh yeah, like what the how the effects of that would have? What would the on... effects of that be? Like on us? Like we would just, yeah, yeah. We would be so filled with joy, like that. Yeah, we would be living heaven on earth because mm -hmm. it feels so good to do that. And to like to go way back to our discussions, to previous episodes, like when we live these individualistic narratives, um, so focused on my, my personal fulfillment, like that, that, that ends up being so dry and dead. Um, but anyway, if our communities just did a couple of these things and, and found out like who, who's on the verge of losing their house, yeah. um, who's, who, uh, what old people 
um, are just don't have people visiting and, and hearing their stories and and grieving uh, over over losses and, and celebrating their triumphs. I mean, these are just the things that Jesus says to do. And again, going back to our discussions last night, this is this is politics. We're, yeah. we're wandering into the wider palace and behaving this way for no reason other than Jesus is Lord, and this is how we enjoy His life-giving reign. And so it's like going all the way back to hell. Let's get According back to, to Jesus, hell. we we need to. Uh, when we don't enjoy Jesus' reign in these specific ways, he says to his people, depart to the place where you've chosen. You've lived a life of selfishness, and this is this is the end of it. It's it's to depart into judgment. So what do you think that is that? Is that like these dynamics of just being in that lifestyle, like just being, I mean, do you think that that, that destruction is our, what we've built that understanding to be, you know, this, this thing that we're all, that at least our culture has been so afraid of this fiery pit of separation for eternity. Is that what we're referencing? Is it? If you're walking down the road towards destruction, is it a posture thing where it's like at the last minute, it is, if you are truly repenting and turning and altering your stance, even though you have been walking this way on the road for a long time, but is it just a posture? Is it a heart posture? Is it, um, how far does it, you know, pass like the invite Jesus into your heart and you're saved from this, Oh yeah. but you're also going to be held accountable for all of this as well. So there's yeah. like a, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, these are all, yeah. <laughs> the light questions. <laughs> well, it, it's just funny because it's like, yeah, these are all the kind of questions that we, it's like we want to know. It's These are the, in some ways, these are the same questions that are like the junior high questions about like how much, like how, what can I get away with? How much is too, you know, what's what's too far? I just see some of the shackles of like people in our communities that are just, they're so weighed down by this yeah. ideology, yeah. The, this fear, this just the fact that we have built this like, we have built a theology on fear, fear. and hell yeah. and stuff. And so now we're looking at the ram. It's like the purity culture conversation. Yeah. We're, we're the generation that's now looking at the ramifications of the purity culture where we're like so much. No, 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 yeah. no. Now that we got a yes for something, we're like, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa. And now I'm reconciling everything. Yeah. yeah. And we can't switch gears. And not only can we not switch gears, no one even taught us how to switch gears. Yeah. Like we're, we're just kind of barrel barreling down the road. Yeah. And, and so I think the the fear of death and hell and that kind of stuff is similar where we've we were raised in this environment and there is so much of an us versus them and there is so much of like a, <clears throat> this is the don't do this don't do this don't do this because and we do start from that place and now we have a generation of adults who are now trying to raise kids yeah but we were raised in this like environment of like fear and yeah. then it's like I don't want my children to grow in I totally. want them to understand who God is. Yeah. I want them to understand this communal thing that we've been talking about. I don't want them to understand God from this fear place. Yeah. At least, you know, in this context. Like, yeah. So I think it's just, I, I only brought that up, and I don't know if there's an answer or, or if that's a week-long conversation. Well, I, I mean, I can tell you how I, how I think about it. It seems to me, um, if I sort of put away, I mean, just break down all these unhelpful ways of thinking, and then try to think about what Scripture says Christian identity is all about. Um, there's actually a range of, there, there are loads of behaviors and um, sort of postures and like bodily postures for, available for being Christian. Um, you know, I see the ideal as this community that, um, you know, warmly uh, embraces life together and then strategizes to serve the wider communities and those are the communities that can be sure that, um, you know, at the day of Christ, they're going to enter into and be transformed into the kingdom of God. The challenge is that so few of our communities are like that. And they're just these kind of big consumer, big box, you know, McMansion churches that have a lot of, you know, services and offerings of services that you can have. You know, here's a whole menu of things for you to have a comfortable <laughs> Sunday for 75 minutes. Um, and so, like, what do you do about that? Uh, it seems to me that, um, at least this is how I conceive of it. I mean, I show up, I, I try to, I try to have my life look as much like what the New Testament's talking about. 
Yeah. And it's like, this is talking about um, uh, really valuing my community, my, my community that gathers in the name of Christ. So I, I gather with them, even on Sunday morning at 9.40, every Sunday I'm just like, oh, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure that I do want to do this. You know, there's a, there's a handful of people a that... a four-wing five. Totally. I'm just like, I could stay home here and be complicated <laughs> on my own. <laughs> And embrace tragedy, <laughs> but uh, it's like yeah, there's people that there's people that need community, and I, I mean that's just a very low need. I don't have there's it doesn't exist actually, um, <laughs> but I'm like I'm gonna get there, and then it's like you know we actually have teams of people that are strategizing to to look after some uh, people in crisis in our city. So like that's I, I'm totally involved in that because that's that's Christian, that's an activity that. Seems like it resonates with what Scripture talks about, um, and the way that I think about it is, I have this life, and I'm just trying to ornament my life with these kinds of behaviors that Scripture talks about, and um, in the hope that this is what this is what God's looking for. I mean, I've I've seen it on the pages of Scripture, um, and I I have opportunities in my life to like. Uh, like further my career or build a bunch of this stuff in it that's going to advance my name or whatever. And I, I look at those things and I just want to think, all right, hold those very loosely and maybe even like, you know, sweep those to the side to clear some space here. Um, well, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'll just tell you recently this was one decision. Um, I mean, Matthew 25 has honestly rocked me because in, in light of all these political discussions of immigration and all this, it just keeps coming up that um, the welcoming the strangers is really, this is, this is the term for foreigners. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I am in a culture that hates foreigners mm-hmm. and in, in an evangelical culture that is like the most militantly anti-immigrant in America. Um, and Jesus is basically saying, that's how you get to, you wanna, you wanna know how to get to hell? Don't welcome this, the foreigner. Yeah. And I'm just like, Bruh! Um, and then also other things. So, so that was a one crisis for me several months ago, but then I kept reading Matthew 25, and there's one of the ways that determines where you go in the end and where the body of humanity goes in the end is visiting those in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, th- this is the list. And I'm just like, all right, you know what? I'm in a new phase of my career. Our, our kids have moved on. I've got some space in my life. I'm like, you know what? Uh, I think I'm going to see if I can, how can I get involved in the jail that's just right down the street. So um, this is, I've started doing this uh, a couple weeks ago, and then this coming Friday I'm going back um, to just start teaching in the jail and spend Friday afternoons with these people and um, talk about discomfort. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, this has been, I've made three visits, and it's just like, phew, I'm a fully middle-class white body. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like I go into that environment, I mean, you know, racially, ethnically, it's completely mixed, but it's like, it's just not my, what I'm used to. Um, but for me, it's like, these are the kinds of things that Jesus says to do. I don't know, they're available to me. I'm just gonna do these things. I'm just gonna jump into this and ornament my life with the kinds of things that Jesus says to do in the hope that in the end, this is what you were looking, I did this stuff. And it's yeah. not like I'm trying to earn it, um, and what I've also discovered is that, like, in the midst of all this, um, my heart and my life is being flooded with joy. Like, yeah. I've been overwhelmed with just lightness. And I come, I, uh, my wife and I have had so many of these conversations, I mean, after sort of working with homeless families, like, we, go, we walk back into our house, we're like, we are loaded. <laughs> yeah. we, I mean, we've got several couches. Yeah. I've got like food for two days in my fridge. Yeah. I've got leftovers. I mean, we are so rich. And so uh, it's not merely that I'm trying to like pacify this angry God. If I really see that God is inviting me into this life of richness and it's counterintuitive. Yeah. You want a life of richness? Visit people in yeah. jail. Yeah. Um, clothe. So it seems like it's mostly like a just it's not this it's not this judgment conversation or this fear it's this whole reframing of um, and it's the same conversation we've had in the previous episodes 
about um, ones we recorded so long ago. Yes, about restructuring church or like being this community yeah. focused thing that when we are coming in line and trying to um, see and hear the things that God has instructed and, and that God is interested in doing and what God is interested in us partnering in, that that is that that's actually the frame that we're looking at yeah. is doing that and pushing fear and um, uh, like ulterior reasoning for things out. Yeah. To the, or not even up to the side, just out of the equation, yeah. and just focusing on these kingdom dynamics. Totally. Uh, but also just on the character of God. Like um, throughout Scripture, we see this, and it's we see it in our world. The constant creation of God in our image, and like we are small-hearted, we're nasty and retaliatory and vengeful, and it's like so we have a nasty, retaliatory, vengeful God because it's like that's how we would construct him, uh, and He's always showing up. As a servant, he's always showing up as shockingly uh, mild and inviting, and he's always showing up to the wrong people, like to Hannah. He hears Hannah's prayer. Um, he hears when Hezekiah is brokenhearted and just turns to the wall and cries. Like he, he's 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 there in those moments. Yeah. And um, we're just so much more comfortable with this transactional, nasty character who it's like, like if you don't give me this. You're gonna pay. All right, let's give him a little bit of that, and then we get off the hook. And you know, we all know this sucks, and we hate him. Yeah. But at least he's not gonna burn, make us burn forever. <laughs> it's like that's our arrangement, and we we have communities that embody that. That's our that's our deity. We're small Keep the hearted. Change a filthy animal. Yeah, we're all pusillanimous, graspy, just nasty people. I mean, at least at least this is how evangelical Christians come off in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, people look at our communities, and this is how we look. We, we're not givers. We're not charitable. Um, we're judgmental and mean-spirited. And when we see on the national stage somebody that embodies that, we love yeah. him. Yeah, I mean, it's like, what is wrong with us? Yeah. I think I think it's because we just have a real hard time with a deity that is not a control freak the way that we are. In fact, you know, he he rules the world from. I mean, all the images of the character of. Of the Lord Jesus ruling creation, are uh, have have everything to do with anything but control. I mean, he on the throne in Revelation is a slaughtered lamb. Yeah. How controlling is that? And you know, the image for Jesus throughout uh, every New Testament document is associated with a cross. Yeah, he rules um, by invitation and by deference and by um, partnership. Yeah. We're funny. It's continually subversive, and we keep building it to like. <laughs> I know we want to make it in our image, yeah. and it's like everything we make hollows out our souls yeah. and, and makes life living hell for us. So, what are we doing? Yeah, we, we don't ever learn. Awesome, man. Thank you, dude. This has been an absolute blast. This is the final episode of We Don't Know, brought to you by some people <laughs> in a place. With many plants. Right, Ferdinand? <laughs> In a relative jungle. Between a couple plants. <laughs> it's sort of amongst plants. Amongst plants. <laughs> amongst several ferns. <laughs> I hate the plants.